The text for this afternoon's sermon is the Word of God as the church has confessed and summarized the teaching of God's Word in Lord's Day 38 of the Heidelberg Catechism, where we confess Scripture's teaching about the meaning and the requirements of God in the fourth commandment. This is on page 554 in your book of praise. What does God require in the fourth commandment first? That the ministry of the gospel and the schools be maintained, and that especially on the day of rest, I diligently attend the church of God to hear God's word, to use the sacraments, to call publicly upon the Lord, and to give Christian offerings for the poor. Second, that all the days of my life I rest from my evil works, let the Lord work in me through his Holy Spirit, and so begin in this life the eternal Sabbath. And of course, this fourth commandment that we just read the explanation of is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, Adam had a very busy Friday, a very busy sixth day of creation. He was formed from the ground and God breathed into him the breath of life. He became a living soul and in the rest of that day, a lot of things happened. He got to know God, his creator. He was introduced to his home, the world, and specifically the garden in the center of it all. He underwent that deep sleep during which God formed for him his wife, and he was married. He heard God's revealed will, do not sin and do obey, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over all creation. That all happened and of course, before his marriage, he got to, to name the animals as well. That all happened on that first day of his creation. And, and then the next day was the Saturday. The next day was the seventh day. And you would think, well, let's get going here because I've just been created and God gave me a job to do. So let's get to it. But the very first full day of Adam in this world, God said, stop. That's what Sabbath means. It means stop. Stop. You can imagine Adam. I, I just... I just got started, Lord. I, I just didn't even have a full day yesterday. Can I get to it? And, and the Lord says, no, stop. The first full day on earth is a day of rest, Adam. You see, God's already teaching from the beginning. It's not what you do. It's what I have done. Rest in my finished work. Enjoy what I have done, what I have made. Rejoice in it. Worship me for it and in it and through it. Worship God for the gift of creation, communion with God and with your wife, your family, with the created world. And so the human race begins the first full day on this earth with worship, not work. Just stopping the regular duties of everyday life and just praising God for who he is and for what he has done. And so that's reflected in the commandments as we come to Exodus chapter 20, for instance, at Mount Sinai. And the Lord says, listen, I freed you from slavery. And that slavery involved a lot of work that was imposed upon you. There was no rest for you. You're free now, free to worship, free to serve me. And so part of that freedom is that you will rest on the seventh day. And the grounds given in Exodus chapter 20, when he gives the law, is that I made the world in six days, and on the seventh day I rested, and you shall too. It's not something modern that the Canadian Reformed churches have made up, or the Reformed churches. It's not something that the New Testament church has made up. It's not something which was invented by God at Sinai. It was something instituted, or instituted in the creation itself. It is part of how the world was made to work. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 5, which is just before what we read a few moments ago, as we're about to enter the promised land, Moses gives the law again. And at the fourth commandment, there are different grounds. This time he says, listen, rest on the seventh day because I freed you from slavery to Egypt. And so God teaches in the 
And the two variants of the fourth commandment, that the day of rest, the day of worship, is a day to celebrate, to rejoice in, to enjoy his mighty acts of creation and his mighty acts of redemption. And that's awesome in the Old Testament. It's a beautiful thing. But it gets, it bursts into even greater glory on Resurrection Sunday. When the Lord Jesus comes out of the grave and he testifies to the entire world that our redemption is accomplished in the Lord Jesus Christ, the last Adam has conquered the power of death and he rises to an immortal life. And so, because of the work of Christ, we worship on the Lord's day. And we celebrate on the Lord's day, the day of rest, the creation and the redemption. We, we rest in order to worship, to fellowship, to engage in acts of love and service and hospitality. We rest in Christ's finished work. But when you look at the explanation of the church as it confesses the teaching of Scripture, it's striking how Lord's Day 38 begins. What is God requiring when he says that we ought to keep the Sabbath day holy? And, and the church says, well, the Bible teaches us first that the ministry of the gospel and the schools be maintained. And that's often a line which maybe gets a mention, a sentence or two in the sermons. But we kind of scud ahead to the rest of the Lord's Day. I want to do the opposite today. I want to just focus on that first sentence, that the ministry of the gospel and the schools be maintained. Why is that there? And we know that Reformed Christians place a great emphasis upon the importance of Christian education. So, so is that why we kind of stuck it in the catechism to justify why we spend so much time and effort and energy and resources on Christian education? Or is this something that the Bible teaches, and that's why we confess it, and that's why we dedicate so much time, energy, and resources to it? Brothers and sisters, the answer is the latter. The Bible teaches the importance of Christian education. And there's a reason for it. Because you can't worship if you don't know. You can't worship whom you do not know. And we, we think of what Paul writes to the Romans in chapter 10, verse 14. He says, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? In order to worship God, you need to believe in God. And then he goes on, and how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? How can you believe in God and thus worship God if you don't know who he is, if you've never heard of him? And then he goes on, and how are they to hear without someone preaching? Now, we know that eternal life is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, to, to know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. That is eternal life, to know God, to know Jesus Christ. And that knowledge means loving, trusting in, and believing. How can we love him if we've never heard of him? How can we know him if nobody has told us about him? How can we worship him if we don't know who he is and what he has done? And so we need people to tell us. And so God sends us preachers. But where do you get preachers from? Preachers need to be sent by the church. But they need to be prepared by the church to be preachers. And so we need seminaries. We need men who study Latin and Hebrew and Greek and exegesis and homiletics and church history and dogmatics and all kinds of other stuff so that they're trained to preach. But we don't just need seminaries to produce preachers. We need other schools to prepare people to go to seminary. Because if you show up at seminary, you don't know how to read. You're not going to be able to handle the course of study. You won't, be, you won't be admitted in the first place. So we need schools so that Future preachers can read and write. They can learn to read and write and, and reason, to evaluate, to study. We need schools to prepare. Now think about it. 
What if no one could read? If no one could read, the Bible would be a closed book. If no single human being on the earth could read, we wouldn't know everything that God reveals to us in his word. We would have just enough knowledge of God from general revelation, from the looking around at the creation, to see his eternal power and his divine nature. But that is just enough to leave us without excuse, and we will be stuck as children of wrath under the judgment of the law, never having heard of Christ. And so we need preachers. And preachers need to know how to read, so we need schools and seminaries to educate and prepare preachers to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ so we can know him, so we can worship him. But it's not just the preacher that needs to be educated. Before the Reformation, the church had spent a lot of time keeping people in the darkness of ignorance. Because people that are ignorant, that aren't taught, are easier to control. And so the Bible was in a language that the people did not understand. Even many priests didn't. Worship was in a language they didn't understand. And so you have all these rituals and ceremonies in this strange tongue that you do not understand. You just follow the orders. You just listen. You just go through the motions. It doesn't mean anything. Just listen to the priest. Well, thankfully, God brought about the Reformation so that the Word of God was put in our language, so that worship was put in our language, so that we could worship with understanding, so that we could read with understanding. Because if you just go through the motions without knowing, without understanding, without learning, then that's mindless worship. It's just rituals. It's just ceremonies. The church thinks for you. The church prays for you. The church before the Reformation even drinks wine for you, as the Roman church still does. The church sings for you, and you just turn off your mind, and you mumble along. But God has never accepted mindless worship. Never. Back in Hosea's day, Hosea 6.6, 6, this is what he says, For I desire steadfast love, and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God, rather than burnt offerings. He's not saying that he doesn't want the sacrifices and the burnt offerings. He's saying, listen, they're meaningless. They're useless. They're empty rituals without steadfast love and the knowledge of God. In Hosea, the same prophet says this, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. For lack of knowledge. Doesn't say my people are destroyed for lack of praise and worship. He says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You think of the Lord Jesus at the well in Samaria with a Samaritan woman, John chapter 4. He says to her, she asks, you know, where, where are we supposed to worship, in, in the Jewish temple or in our own temple right here? He says, you worship what you do not know. You see, the Scriptures were closed to the Samaritans. They, they, they had their own version of the Scriptures. They had their own version of the Word of God. They had their own version of the worship of God. They had their own temple, their own priesthood. It was all stuff that they had made up just the way they liked it. And Jesus says, you're worshiping what you do not know. You see, true worship, vibrant, real, spiritual worship, requires preachers who have been educated, requires an educated congregation to worship with understanding. And Jesus says that to the Samaritan woman. He says, we worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. Now, why is salvation from the Jews? Because they have the promises. They have the oracles of God. They have the word of God. They read the word. They studied the word. They knew God and they knew the works of God through his revelation. And therefore, they could worship because they knew. That's why the Old Testament church, already way back in the Old Testament, the church focused on knowing the Scriptures, on teaching the Scriptures. 
on knowing them yourself as a parent and teaching them to your children. We read that in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Education, first of all, was so that people could have access to the most life-giving power in the universe. The power of God unto salvation, the gospel, the revelation of God. It's the most important thing. It's more important than food and drink itself, more important than life itself. So education, first of all, was so that children could learn to read, to know the word. What does Paul say to Timothy? He says, from childhood, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Timothy's dad was not Jewish, but his mom was, and she faithfully taught him the word of God, because it is the word of God which makes you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And so, brothers and sisters, a congregation which knows the word of God and which knows the God of the word is an important and vital part of true worship for many reasons, and one of them being that a, a congregation that knows the word keeps the preacher honest. You think of Acts chapter 17, and the apostles came to town in Berea, and the Bereans, says the scripture, were noble. Why were they noble? Because they received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Here came the apostles. These men could raise the dead. They could write the actual word of God on paper, and it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. They could speak the very oracles of heaven. They could heal the sick. They could speak in all kinds of tongues, in all kinds of mighty gifts of the Holy Spirit. And here they come with all these powers and all these evidences and all these gifts, and they speak the gospel. And the Bereans say, that sounds really good. Let's check the scriptures and make sure you're saying the right thing here. An educated congregation, a congregation that knows the word, keeps the preacher honest. So why is there this emphasis on good, solid Christian education? And why do we talk about it in connection with the fourth commandment, the day of rest, the day of worship? Because true worship requires true knowledge. We need to know God and the mighty works of God, because the more we know, the more we praise, the more we worship. There in Deuteronomy chapter 6, we read it. God said, look, you've got to know my law. You've got to know my commands. You've got to know my will. You've got to know how I want to be worshipped. You've got to know who I am and what I have done. You need to know about how I've created the world, and how I have saved my people from slavery. And you need to love your God. You need to love him with all your heart and soul and might. And you need to pass on not the external husk of religion. You don't need to pass on just the traditions and the ceremonies and the rituals and the empty shell of religiosity. And when the kids say, why are we doing this? They say, well, that's because we've always done it that way because Old Ben Oma did it that way, and you got to do it that way too. Because I say so. And God says, that's not the way it is, my people. These words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You must know, not just with the mind, you must know God. You must believe God. And that knowing God, that believing God must drive you to worship in all of your life, that your whole life is about God and unto God and from God. So that when you're teaching your kids, you're not just saying words, but you're teaching by your worship and you're worshiping as you teach your home. When you go out at bedtime, when you start the day together, who is God? What has he done? And the more you study those truths, the more you worship and teach your children to do the same thing. 
Now, Paul speaks about that, the connection between knowing and living for God and, and worshiping God, as he, he speaks in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Romans 12, 1 and 2, this is what he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Live as an act of perpetual worship. Why? How? Well, look at verse 2 of chapter 12. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. It's with the mind that we know who he is and what he has done. That by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That's how we live a life of worship, with minds that are renewed by the power of the Holy Spirit, working through the power of the Word. And so the Lord's Day cannot be a real Lord's Day. The Lord's Day cannot be a day of real worship if we are dull of understanding, if we are a people destroyed for lack of knowledge, if we are a people that have spent the entire week with this massive tube, this massive uh, fire hose of the froth and the scum which lies on the top of modern culture, filling our eyes, our ears, our minds, and our hearts. We and our children can only truly worship when we know the Lord. And so the fourth commandment frees us. It's, this is the law of perfect liberty. It is a commandment which frees us from slavery to the ephemeral, to the, to the mist of the enslavement to social media, pop culture, the latest trifles of vanity, fear, and all the, the, the little baubles that the world holds out to us, the, the little shiny little trinkets. The fourth commandment frees us from addiction to work. It frees us from sitting here on Sundays thinking, man, if I could just be at work now, I could make overtime and I could make so much more money and buy so many more things. It frees us from that. The fourth commandment liberates us to pour time and money and energy and resources on Christian education, not just on, on one, one day a week, but throughout the week. It's an incredible blessing, brothers and sisters, that the Holy Spirit has given to us also as a congregation that in this congregation, there is a massive amount of investment of every type of resource into Christian education in the home, in the catechism classes, in the Christian schools, in the Bible studies, supporting the seminary. In a way, I would think that almost every family and every member in some way is connected to this beautiful work of Christian education. It is beautiful. It's amazing. And praise God for it. Why do we why do we pour ourselves into it the way we do? Because we know that the Scripture teaches that we worship what we know. And we want to be worshipers of God. We want our children to be worshipers of God. And to worship God, they need to know God and His works. We want our children to be able to see the fingerprints of God in the world. The complexity of the cell the glories of the solar system and the galaxies, the intricacies of particle physics, the beauty of the arts, the fascinating wonders of the animal kingdom. We want our children to be able to see the language of God in the infinite elegance of mathematics, his providential creation and care in the immense oceans and deserts and jungles and every type of ecosystem, his power in the massive forces in the storms and the weather and the cold and the heat and the fearsome energy contained in the nucleus of the atom. And the energy of a hundred billion one megaton bombs exploding every second in that sun that he has placed in the sky. We want our children to know these things because when they know them, they know him and they worship him. They need to be able to read and to study to learn, to discern, to evaluate, to investigate, to know. Not just to walk like a robot, an automaton, 
doing the same things that mom and dad did, lisping the same words like a parrot or by rote that mom and dad said, praying the same form of prayers mindlessly, passed down from generation to generation. We want them to know, to know him, to know his works, to know his glory, his power, his majesty. And then we want them to know him in the scripture. As they read in the scripture and learn things that you can't learn from general revelation, as they learn from the scripture why things don't work properly in this world, why things are broken, why there's so much pain and suffering, and what God did about it to fix it. We want them to be able to read the glorious gospel promises of the coming Messiah, promises made from the beginning, promises kept and fulfilled in Christ. We want them to know the scriptures so that they can know Christ and the power of his resurrection. We want them to know God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, God the Creator, Redeemer, and Renewer. That's why on the Lord's Day, we stop. We stop our daily work and routines and activities. We gather to worship and pray, to love and care for the needy, to fellowship, to have communion in the Word and the Spirit. And as we come, the more the preacher has been taught to know him and his great acts of salvation, the more the congregation has been taught to know him and his great acts of salvation, the more we can really worship and exalt and lift up his name. So kids, children, young people, that means that education and study, even though it has to do with your career and your, what might be your life's work, that is not the first reason for your study, your education. We don't go to school and study and learn, first of all, to get a good job, to make good money. But first of all, we learn to worship, to learn of God in his world and in his word, to know God. That's the reason you read, you learn, you study, you go to school. You go to church, you go to catechism to know God better, to know God more so you can worship him better. And so that means, children, young people, that when you're lazy and you don't work hard at school, you don't do your homework, and you don't try your best, you know what you're really saying? He's saying, I don't want to know God. I don't want to know God. I don't want to worship God. That's a bad thing. That's not something that belongs to a son or daughter of the King of Kings. We give ourselves to our study. We pour our heart and soul into our studies because the more we learn, the more we study, the more we grow in knowing him and his world, his creation, his salvation, his word. And the more we know these things, the more we worship in spirit and truth. That's why we value Christian education and we value education of every type. Doesn't, you don't have to have a diploma. You can have a grade seven education to be well-educated in the world that God has made and the word that he has given to us. We value education of every type because it helps us to know God and to worship God. Well, I'm just focusing on this first sentence in the Lord's Day, and so I'm really hammering at this, but hopefully that's helpful for us to really pay attention to how important this is, that worship, brothers and sisters, is about knowing. This is, I have to stop and say this because we live in a culture which prioritizes feeling and emotion over knowledge. And so people go by how they feel. They make decisions about how they feel. They make or unmake relationships based on how they feel in the first place. Now, feelings and emotions are parts of who, 
we are as, as, as created men and women created in the image of God. They, they are a part of who we are. They're a part of our worship, but they're not the basis of our worship. They're not the driving force or the principal part of our worship. What drives our worship is that we know him. What drives our worship is what we know and who we know. And you read the scriptures, you read the New Testament, and it hammers on that point over and over. The apostles don't say, well, we feel, or we, we're inclined to think maybe, and this is my kind of idea about this, or my feeling about that, or my emotion about this. No, the apostles over and over say, we know. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him. We know that we are from God. We know that he hears us in whatever we ask. We know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. We know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth unto now. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true in his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. We know him and the power of his resurrection. That's what faith is. That's what faith is. It's to know and to be sure about what we know because what we know is anchored in the very person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so because we know, we worship. What does the psalmist say? Psalm 4610, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. God says that to us. Be still and know that I am God, that I will be exalted. And we say, amen, Lord. We know who you are. We know what you have done in Jesus Christ. And because we know, we worship you. Amen.